an introduction to chaplaincy um, for those that are trying to discern this possible path forward. Um, we are thrilled to have you all here. We're thrilled to have our panelists here. Um, we hope this is a very lively and rich conversation. We have a lot of excellent expertise and experience in this virtual room that we're grateful to have joining us. Um, and we just, first of all, want to say that we are grateful for your presence and for your curiosity and hope that this can be a, a conversation and a listening session of discernment for you. Um, not simply informational, but also um, discerning and, and vocational, hopefully. Uh, that's, that's our goal in this space. Um, and so the, the reason why we're hosting this space, I'm, I'm, my name is Dr. John Edwards, and I am um, the co-director of our MA in Ministry and Theology program at Villanova with Dr. Jennifer Jackson, who is here with me. And the two of us are going to host this panel uh, supported by the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Graduate Studies, um, who has made the technology and the the back the back end possible. Um, and we're here because we're very lucky and very excited that for, that Villanova has recently been able to launch a chaplaincy track, chaplaincy education track within our MA in Ministry and Theology degree program um, as one of the options for a track within that degree. Um, we were able to launch it this year to start officially in the fall. So we're actively seeking and encouraging people to discern um, applying to this to this track. But also because chaplaincy is a grow, there's a growing need for chaplains across the country. Um, for many, many, many decades, religious men and women served um, as chaplains in, in our hospitals, and those numbers are just shifting. And so the need for chaplaincy is, is increasing in our hospitals, um, in prison settings, in corporate settings. And so we're gonna hear a little bit about from different these different voices that are joining us today about what um, what those roles look like, what the path to chaplaincy might be like, um, what some of their ex own experience in pursuing and discerning chaplaincy has, has been like for themselves, um, and then engage with one another and also invite some of your questions and comments. Um, so we're very lucky to be here with our panelists. I'm going to ask Dr. Jackson to begin by introducing some of our panelists, and then we will have some time for conversation and hearing from them. Thanks so much, John. Um, I just want to echo Dr. Edwards' words of welcome to everyone and just how excited we are about uh, about chaplaincy education in general and about this track for Villanova. And, and the fact that we can all be reflecting tonight on what a ministry of accompaniment really is, and that's because that's chaplaincy education is very much that. So, so thank you for being with us. Uh, I would just like to introduce to you formally each of the panelists who have generously joined us this evening. So I will share their names, and uh, then I'm going to make one more introduction. Um, and then we will we'll begin with the, uh, the, the contributions from each of the panelists. So tonight I am delighted to welcome Erica Cohen Moore, who is Executive Director for the National Association of Catholic Chaplains, Jack Garachi, ACPE Certified Educator and Manager of the St. Mary's CPE Program for the Mid-Atlantic Region, Emily Southerton, Associate Chaplain and Spirit Alive Coordinator for Phoebe Ministries and alumna, Villanova alumna, and Nicholas Kalora, Director of Pastoral Care for Hospice and Ambulatory Care at Redeemer Health Network in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. So before we we have each of our panelists share this evening, um, I'm also delighted to uh, and, and grateful to Juan Cruz, who is Associate Director for Admissions and Recruitment with Graduate Studies at Villanova University. And Juan's going to just speak uh, briefly uh, uh, to share a little bit uh, with, with our group um, uh, as, as, a, as his for his own welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And, and as Dr. Uh, Edwards and Dr. Jackson said, I don't want to take too much of your time because the focus is certainly on the panelists. I just wanted to share a brief uh, uh, brief admissions presentation about, uh, about Villanova. 
So as uh, Dr. Edwards mentioned, uh, this is being recorded. It's more of an FYI at this point. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with where Villanova is located, we are right outside of Philadelphia. We're not actually in Philadelphia. And as you can see there, we're a short ride away from both New York City and Washington, D.C. Uh, but Villanova itself is pretty accessible to the sixth largest city in the country, also considered the second best place to visit, according to use from the port, and certainly very, very historically significant in terms of uh, not just American history, but I think world history at this point. It's certainly a cultural capital with more than 85 movies uh, being filmed here. I'd like to share this one photo, one of my favorite photos of, uh, of the chapel found at Villanova. And as you can see, we're both far enough away and close enough to the networking opportunities that you can get uh, in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, nothing will compare to being uh, on campus. Uh, however, we encourage you to go to virtualvisit.vonova.edu to see more of what campus looks like. And we do hold graduate student-led tours uh, on uh, from our website and from our office if you decide to visit Villanova if you've not been here before. Uh, just some few fast facts. There's about 11,000 students spread out across six colleges, the vast majority of which are graduate students. We are considered a top-ranked university according to U.S. News Report. The average class size is 15 students, and since we have two program directors uh, with us today, they can certainly speak a little bit more about uh, the class sizes within uh, the graduate theology programs. And each and every single year, we have over 60 graduate students present an academic conference each year. So what I like to say to folks is that whether you're looking at uh, the chaplaincy track as a, as a terminal point of your master's degree, or perhaps as a future stepping stone for future doctoral work, uh, you are certainly in good company of folks that are going through the program with uh, their career and their academic future in mind. In terms of the application process, this is very straightforward. Submitting the application, which gives you access to the application status page, submitting the additional materials to complete your application. Now, the materials you see here are for the Masters of Ministry and Theology. If you are interested in some of the other programs that we offer, uh, certainly these will change. And then Department Review, which is reviewed on a rolling basis. Uh, I like to include some photos of uh, of campus. If you've not been here before, there's a photo of Core Hall in the height of winter. I don't think we're going to see this much snow this year, which I, for me, have having I've seen enough snow in my life that uh, I don't think I want to see this much snow again. Uh, for transcripts, if you decide to apply with us, we can accept unofficial transcripts in the beginning. So uh, typically, official transcripts will cost a little bit of money, but we can accept unofficial transcripts in the beginning. This is a photo of Riley Lips in a little bit of a, a greener pasture than the last uh, photo. If you squint in the back there, you'll see a, a sculpture that kind of looks like an Oreo. Uh, and so uh, affectionately within faculty staff, mm -hmm. we call it the Oreo, although formally it is known as the Awakening. But you might hear uh, a, a Villanova student say, let's go meet at the Oreo. And they don't mean the snack. They mean uh, the sculpture that you see in the back. Uh, we do require a three-letters recommendation for this program and many others, and that contact information is submitted within the Outplan, uh, online application. And we, uh, as a general tip to most folks applying to our programs, to please plan for unforeseen delays. We know that when snow happens, vacations happen for recommenders, they can sometimes delay the completion of an application. Uh, so those are the, uh, the quick review of the application requirements, and certainly there are a numerous ways that we support our students here at, uh, here at Villanova University, whether it's through the Online Writing Center, it's access to the library on campus and online, and certainly you will have access to university events happening uh, all the time. And there's also a number of professional developments that you can tap into as a Villanova student and as a Villanova alumni. And as being part of the alumni network, uh, a number of online specific uh, platforms that you can utilize as either a current or an alumnus student, uh, but also things that you can certainly start to utilize even as a student when you're not only looking at the completion of your master's degree, but uh, at what might happen and what you hope to happen afterwards. And so again, my name is Juan Cruz, the Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment. You're welcome to contact me for any admissions related questions you have at juan.cruz at villanova.edu. Uh, I also included our office email there, gradinfo at villanova.edu, if you have any questions about starting an application. 
And I will go ahead and share with you all now that uh, we are happy to waive your application fee for sharing your time with us. It's AS Info. You should find a question in the application that asks whether you have an application fee waiver code. And so if you decide to move forward with us, we will go ahead and waive that fee with that code AS Info. And I thought uh, the words of Father Peter, the current president of uh, Villanova, was quite apt for this session. It is actually a quote that I like to share for her uh, across all my sessions, uh, not just uh, chaplaincy, that we are an Augustinian community that moves forward, that is not complacent, that believes the best way to improve your own life is by improving the lives of others. And so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it back to Dr. Jackson to continue with the rest of the panel. Juan, thank you so much and for your support of this session. We're really grateful. I'd like to uh, begin our presentations by the by panelists and uh, to uh, introduce first again, Erica Cohen Moore, who will share uh, some really important contributions from her own experience and leadership in terms of, of chaplaincy. Thanks, Erica. She's muted. There, sorry, the host had to unmute me. That's brilliant, by the way. My kids would love that as well. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate this invitation. Um, anytime I have the opportunity to speak of chaplaincy, I'm so happy to do it. Um, I'm Erica Cohen Moore. I'm the executive director for the National Association of Catholic Chaplains. Um, we are based out of Milwaukee, but I actually live in Seattle. So it's still my afternoon. Um, so it's great to see all of you, Midwest and East Coast and East, East Coasters. Um, so just a quick overview of what we do and just part of my own story. Um, we are a certifying body for chaplains. And if you do pursue chaplaincy, I imagine um, I will get to know and meet some of you. And um, we do board certification. And then we're an organization also working on an associate um, certification. And I can talk more about that. But it's we really in the past have been um, an organization, and we've been around since 1965. And we're the primary certifying body for Catholics. And our goal in the past has really been to promote and lift up um, chaplains in healthcare, but we are growing exponentially and we're recognizing the incredible change um, and a need and that the area chaplaincy is growing in other areas and we're excited to see it and we're hoping to grow with all of you as you venture into hopefully this journey of chaplaincy and so healthcare, um, but we've also worked in the world of prisons and the carceral system. Um, working with people in the seafarer ministry, going on ships and cruises, um, human trafficking, domestic abuse, parish ministry, first responders. Um, and some of you are probably coming with a very specific story and a specific vocation. And if we had time, I would love to hear each of your stories and why you're here tonight. Um, but eventually, not, not at the moment, but eventually. But there's just, chaplaincy is growing and the need for chaplaincy is growing. And it's very exciting to see it happen, especially since COVID. COVID really, um, lifted up the need, especially in the healthcare realm for chaplaincy, and that it's not just about physical wellness, but it's also about mental health and well-being and this whole wellness space. And chaplaincy lives so well in this wellness space. Um, and so we try to um, work with that. And then, so the NACC, we've been known for board certification. We're looking at a associate certification. And that's where um, if you're board certified, it means you're um, a graduate degree with four units of CPE. An associate chaplaincy would be a bachelor's degree with two units of CPE with some graduate study. And so there's some different avenues and different um, pathways into chaplaincy now, and which we're excited about. Um, but just really, I want to cut my time short so I have time to hear your questions and hear the other speakers. Um, just personally, so you know my own story, uh, I started as an econ major in college and found a, was really called to a vocation of chaplaincy. I started doing prison ministry 
uh, as a volunteer in college, and I just was profoundly called to the um, ministry. And so I changed my vocation from economics to theology, and here I am 20-some years later. And so really excited, um, especially for those of you who are exploring ministry in a field outside of healthcare, although our organization works very, um, we work a lot with healthcare. I'm very interested in people entering into this field in other areas because it's um, it's growing and it's exciting to see it grow. So I'll keep it very simple. And then I will put my email in the chat room. So if you have any questions for me, please feel, reach, uh, feel free to reach out. And if we have time for Q&A at the end, we'll do that. So I'll just keep it very short and simple. Erica, thank you so much. Next, we have Jack Garachi, who will be uh, speaking to us from St. Mary. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jack, and I've been at St. Mary 11 years as the uh, manager of the CPE program. Um, my, I started out in, uh, actually, I was a registered nurse for about 12 years, and then I went into ministries, um, professional ministry, and uh, this is about my 18th year now uh, in CPE. So. Thank you, Jen for, and John for having me. Um, we're asked to think about what's the, what's the joy that chaplaincy brings uh, to each of us. Um, I, think, I think for me, I, I'm a person of relationship. I love, I love relationships. And I, I, it's, I, I get much joy, I receive much joy in knowing that God blesses these encounters that I have with patients and family members and colleagues who, at some of the most difficult times of their lives, they're really seeking to tell their sacred narrative. And I feel honored and blessed to receive those. Um, I, I feel honored to meet every person that I meet uh, as pure mystery. And I'm always looking to be surprised by the patients and family members that I meet. So I, I have the best job in the world and I love I love working with my students um, in the same way. I, I find my students to be tremendously um, giving and um, mystery themselves. And so I love what I do. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about what chaplaincy is. And, and um, I thought I'd just begin with maybe what it's not that might help us uh, put it in context a bit. So um, chaplaincy, uh, chaplains are not counselors or therapists. We're not psychotherapists, we're not counselors. Uh, although we borrow a lot of the skills uh, that are necessary uh, that counselors and therapists utilize. Um, we're not interested in changing the behaviors of people. That's not, uh, we don't have that agenda. Um, and although sometimes people after being with us, um, we might find inspiration for a change in their, in their direction of their life, but we don't, we don't meet people with that type of an agenda. Um, usually chaplains are not encountering people who have previously processed their particular pain or spiritual distress, such as, you know, you might find as a therapist. I always say to my students, you know, if you're a therapist or a counselor, you probably receive phone calls in your office and someone is saying things like, well, you know, I've been drinking and it's it's ruining my marriage, so I, I, I want to see you. And those that person has begun uh, 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 having awareness about their problem. They might have begun to process that. But those of us in chaplaincy are usually meeting people that are in raw pain. So they're, you know, they may be, a, um, you know, a diagnosis of cancer the hour before I walk into the room. And so, or I might be in the emergency room with someone whose child was injured but in a car accident. Um, there isn't really time to process. So that's that's who chaplains often meet, uh, people who are in raw, raw pain. On the other hand, we do encounter people, um, you know, who uh, oftentimes want to share their story. They they want to be known. And uh, we are not spiritual directors, although we too uh, borrow from the, the discipline of spiritual direction. Um, many of the people that we meet in hospitals, campus ministries, prisons, are, are often seeking to make meaning of their situation uh, and perhaps where the spirit of God or their divine is directing them. And so as chaplains, we're, we're prepared to accompany them uh, in that desire. Um, 
Um, but it's not always the case. So I lifted up counseling, therapists, spiritual directors. We borrow from all of those disciplines. But it's all to say that we borrow, but essentially chaplains provide a deep, supportive listening uh, or a listening presence for people who are experiencing often tremendous spiritual distress in, in various situations. I like to call it contemplative listening. And that's the skills that the chaplain um, is, is about developing. In, in healthcare, which I know best, uh, we are members of the interdisciplinary team. So we, we are neck and neck with nurses and pharmacists and case managers and physicians. We are part of the team. And we do conduct uh, spiritual assessments of people. So our, our encounters are documented. We make an assessment as, as professionals as to what we, we experience the spiritual pain, distress of a person, or perhaps the resources that the spiritual resources that they have. So we are trained and educated to make those uh, assessments. We're, um, we also are here for our, our colleagues, our staff and, um, and family members. So we, we really do try to meet the needs of people, not only our patients, but they certainly are our primary. And we're really concerned about how a person is coping with the situation that they find themselves in. Do they have resources that are helping them cope with their diagnosis uh, or not? And uh, whatever, whatever the strength is, whatever the coping skill is that the person has, chaplains wanna support that. And sometimes that is about talking about God or who is divine or who is transcendent in that person's life. But honestly, oftentimes it's not, it really is listening to the ordinary uh, story of a person, which through my lens as a chaplain, I see a sacred narrative. So um, I, I like to also reference Pope Francis as he, uh, he speaks about the essence of pastoral ministry as being one in which the minister encounters and accompanies the other. I think Jennifer used that word, accompanying. Um, the patient-chaplain relationship is very much one of encountering and accompanying. Uh, I constantly am reminded of Jesus's encounter uh, with the disciples on the road to Emmaus um, as a model for chaplains, meeting people in their distress, um, taking on a beginner's mind, tell me what you've been talking about uh, as you go your way, um, chaplaincy is a humble presence and um, joining with the other, not in some type of exalted authority or person who has all the answers, um, but really tell me, uh, I, I want to listen. Uh, finally, I'd say chaplains encounter people with reverence. Uh, and as I said, we listen contemplatively, often for the stream under the stream that, that we're hearing. Uh, regardless uh, if the divine is referenced or not. And um, through the lens of the chaplain, all patients' narratives are spiritual or sacred. That's my belief. Um, there are many, if not more times in my experience when God or the divine is not lifted up, but the patient's narrative of loneliness and fear, anger, joy, uh, speaks to their spirituality. Um, in some sense, chaplaincy is costly because we sit in positions with people where emotionally, um, as I said, we sit with people in their raw pain and we're not there to fix them. We're not trying to change their behaviors, but we are, uh, we are a presence of the, of the sacred. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I love talking about it and I can go on for hours, but um, I think I'll stop there. Is that okay? That's okay. It's beautiful, Jack. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Okay. Emily, we'd love to welcome you from Phoebe Ministries. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I graduated from Villanova in 2019. I did my master's um, in theology and certification in pastoral ministry. And before I came to Villanova, I um, had a background in philosophy and theology and a focus in bioethics, but I had no awareness of what chaplaincy was 
or even that there was such a thing as chaplaincy in healthcare settings, in prisons, in retirement facilities. And so Villanova for me um, formed me not only in ministry, but gave me a direction um, and brought all my gifts together that then I could use um, in chaplaincy. So um, I'm glad to be here. I'm very grateful. And I am, so I'm a Catholic chaplain. I just applied for um, board certification. And yes, I'm looking forward to the spring interview and, and being a certified chaplain. I um, attended Villanova and did a unit of CPE between my first year and my second year. Um, and that was by a su suggestion from um, Father John Calderon. He just suggested, you know, you should try out chaplaincy to know if it's for you or if it's not for you. And you'd probably get a quick sense right away. And so I'm forever really grateful for that suggestion. So I did a unit um, of chaplaincy between my two years at Villanova. And then after graduating in 2019, I went on to um, work at Christiana Care as a resident. And oftentimes um, with chaplaincy, maybe you do one unit and then you do another, or maybe you do one unit and then you do a residency, which is three that are combined together and usually are the course of a year. And so for myself, I did one unit and then I did a residency. And we started in August of 2020 and then COVID hit and I learned about trauma and I learned about trauma response. Um, I also learned in residency about family systems and how to, um, Jack was sharing about the different disciplines that we might lend or borrow from. And so through CPE, I learned so much about what I bring into an interaction and what others are bringing into the interaction and how to kind of step aside to be able to meet people where they're at, to be able to hear what's really happening um, and also to serve as a bridge. Oftentimes when people come into a hospital, they might not um, be, have those connections that they need, uh, especially if there's end of life involved. And so, um, so residency really share, showed me and provided a great way, uh, a great um, way to continue to professionalize their standards, professional chaplain standards. Um, so a little, that's a little bit about my story. I want to share a little bit of what brings me joy. And I have some photos here because I often connect with visual art and, um, with pictures. So I'm going to share my screen. It's just four slides. There we are. So chaplaincy, this is a, a picture of me, um, leading a group. I work at a UCC, a United Church of Christ, um, continuing care retirement facility. And we use, we have all different types of um, folks who live in these communities. They might live there for 20 years. They might live there for two years or, or even less, but it's a community, a living community. And I often lead groups. I, um, in the hospital, I only maybe had one or two visits with the patient, and I didn't really get to establish a relationship. Whereas here at Phoebe, the thing I love most is being able to connect and get to know someone's life story, but then go back again and again and get to know them more. And in turn, they get to know me more too. And so, um, so this is a picture of chaplaincy and what, what I find the most joy in. Joy in chaplain ministry for me is being able to use um, the things that I learned in grad school, um, especially there's a, a course I took on um, incarnational pedagogy and thinking about how we kind of engage the faith stories in an incarnational way. And so I've taken that into my ministry and um, Phoebe has a program that's called Spirit Alive, which uses actual props and actual um like sense and things to engage our senses so that we can spark memories, we can spark connection, especially with folks who have dementia, who might not even know their own name or know my name or somebody's name sitting next to them. So um, it's creative. Chaplaincy, I'll say, is very creative. There's ways to be able to engage people. And, and my biggest joy is find the connection whether it's in faith, whether it's in one individual's life story, 
um, there's many ways to, to form connection. So the picture at the top is a recent group I led, and it was using Spirit Alive and using props to help them set a stage and set a scene. Um, and then the picture on the left was another group I led talking about spring, and we all came around and talked about things that make a spring day spring. So it's a different angle of chaplaincy in CCRCs and continuing care retirement facilities. It's more of maybe connecting and leading programs and really getting to know somebody um, as they're journeying um, in, the, in the end of their life. This slide um, on the left, there's some pictures of um, like a, a satchel of lavender. So that's incorporating the senses. And then you see a eucalyptus oil there, or frankincense oil. So kind of weaving in all the senses, which these are things that I learned from the incarnational pedagogy course that I took with, um, we read Bell Hooks and we read um, Maria Montessori's work. And so it just, Formed, I'm going back to how much Villanova was a springboard for me, and it really gave me theoretical things, but also that became very practical for me. Another course that I took was um, sacraments and anointing of the sick and um, communion services for elderly. At the time, I didn't write a paper on um, communion services for elderly, but I did focus on anointing the sick because at that point I was already heading towards chaplaincy. And um, during the COVID, during the height of COVID, when most of our facilities were closed, um, I drew, drew from the resources from this sacraments course to kind of bring into question these, um, the CMS guidelines around um, no visitation and trying to really advocate for the patients to be able to have anointing of the sick on, on their deathbed. Uh, and then educating for the mission I'm kind of going up through these courses that really impacted my ministry. Educating for the mission, I wrote a research paper on mission leadership and healthcare. And then we also had to um, write a, a mission statement on um, what, our, what our mission statement would look like in Catholic healthcare. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, the pastoral ministry courses, where we wrote verbatims, we attended supervision bi-weekly or bi-monthly, and then we read um, important authors like James Cone and the conversations around race, faith, and relationship, which to this day with elder folks, I still talk to them about these topics of race, faith, and relationship. So for me, what brings me joy in chaplaincy is connection and forming relationships. I often think about being a chaplain as being a bridge, whether the person um, has access to all their spiritual needs where they're at, and if not, finding avenues for them to be able to feel fulfilled, feel um, that their needs are being, their spiritual needs are being met. And then we have CPE too. I'm just going to um, put this out there that if you, um, Father John Calderon really um, inspired me to take a unit, so if that's something you're kind of wondering about, I encourage you to just try a unit out, whether it's at a hospital or whether it's at a retirement facility. I kind of outlined the, the different qualities that you might find at a retirement facility, such as leading groups or being able to foster long-term relationships, um, more than just a, a kind of one-time visit. And, and less trauma and blood. I um, became very quickly aware that there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of blood in a hospital setting. And so here in um, BB Ministries, I, we see much, it's a different setting. I'm gonna say that. Okay. I'm excited to hear any of your guys' questions as we get towards the questions and answers. Um, and I'll put my contact info in the, um, in the chat. Emily, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, I would like to, whoops, my clock timer is going off. Um, I would like to welcome again, Nicholas Kalura uh, from Redeemer Health Network. Thank you, Nicholas. 
Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. Um, you know, if I were to reflect on what brings me joy as a chaplain, I would say it's uh, really the many, many stories that I've had the privilege of hearing. And so I thought I'd just give you an idea. Uh, I'll begin and end this brief little reflection uh, with a story. So here's my story to begin with. Um, I was a chaplain on the surgical step-down unit at Einstein Medical Center in North Philadelphia. And uh, I got a page from a nurse who said, you know, there's this youngish guy who's in his 30s or so, uh, very pleasant, not very talkative, uh, who was recovering from uh, surgery after a motorcycle accident. And he'd been there on the step-down unit for about a week. And that whole week, no one had come to visit him. No one had called. Uh, he was completely alone. And the nurse said, you know, every time we ask, you know, is there some family we can contact? He's always like, no, no, it's okay. It's fine. But but he must have someone, right? So can you go and talk to him and try to get him to, you know, spill the <laughs> beans or whatever? So we often get these requests where, uh, you know, someone kind of has our agenda or marching orders that we receive, uh, whether that's what the person needs or not. But we, we know that going in. So I went in and the uh, guy was really, really pleasant. Um, like I said, not very talkative kind of got around to asking the question that the nurse wanted me to ask, you know, is there anyone? He's no, 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 I'm okay. Really? Yeah. Anyone we can call? No, 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 that's fine. Um, so it's okay. So we kind of spent some time and maybe the conversation wasn't really going anywhere, but I said, well, maybe there's something else, you know, that he wants to talk about. So I said, after 10 minutes of this, I said, you know, is, is there anything else in your mind um, that you'd like to talk about while I'm here? No, no, it's no, fine. <laughs> But then he kind of got a thoughtful look in his eyes and he said, uh, there's just this song that's been stuck in my head. And I said, really? Well, what's what's the song? And he said, have you ever heard Stevie Wonders? I just called to say I love you. And I said, you know, is there anyone you wish could call and say I love you? And he said, I've been thinking about my brother a lot. And we proceeded to have a conversation about his relationship with his estranged brother. I think it just took someone to be there for 10 minutes to give that time in a busy hospital where the nurses and medical team are in and out, just took some time. So that's my opening story, just to give a little vignette. I've also been asked to talk about uh, how, what it's like to discern a uh, career or vocation in chaplaincy. And uh, I'm glad, you know, <clears throat> Emily kind of mentioned, you know, check it out. It, it's hard to imagine what it could be like really until you've done it. But I'd even go beyond that, which is it can be tricky sometimes because different contexts, different settings of chaplaincy can be so different. Emily uh, alluded to that too. So for example, currently I uh, manage a team of hospice chaplains um, and I've noticed some people, uh, and then there's like another team in the facilities uh, that we have. So, and I've seen people go back and forth between those teams. For some, it's like, uh, which was kind of the case for me when I finished uh, at that trauma one hospital that I mentioned before, Einstein, uh, I was feeling like, I, I don't know if I can do trauma chaplaincy or hospital chaplaincy full time every day for the rest of my life. But I found this role uh, in uh, palliative care on a palliative care team, visiting patients in their homes. And I loved that. I would go and visit with the patient. We'd sit for an hour or so. And then I'd get 30 minutes to drive and kind of process it in my head before I saw someone else. So lots of little breaks. And I see some people come onto my team of hospice chaplains because that rhythm kind of works for them. And then I've also had a chaplain on my hospice team who's just such a people person, such an extrovert. And he's like, I'm spending so much time in the car. I can't stand it. So wound up going over to the facility side where he could just, you know, walk the halls and stick his head in and see more patients than he was able to see on the hospice team. And that was a good fit for him. So different contexts kind of vary. And uh, I think there's really something to be said for a program, certainly CPE, a program like Villanova's, where you're kind of talking to different people who are doing different kinds of different settings in chaplaincy. Maybe you try a few, um, but definitely recommend uh, uh, trying it. And, you know, uh, Sometimes it's a question of timing. Um, I know that I did my first unit of CPE um, at uh, Mass General Hospital. I was on the medical ICU. It was my first encounter with real human suffering, and I was losing patients. I was seeing people die, you know, on a regular basis. And, you know, for a while, it was like too much. I finished that unit, and I said, I don't think I'll ever work in chaplaincy again. I was just so haunted by some of these stories, but it just took me a little time to process it. I wound up joining the Jesuits, becoming a Jesuit for a few years. And when I left the Jesuits, realized that wasn't my call. For some reason, I had this little intuition that maybe doing CPE again would be a good thing for me. 
and my reasoning was, you know, CPE, the hospital chaplaincy was hard when I did it the first time, but you get this uh, cohort of other people who are working on themselves. And I said, well, if I'm leaving this vocation with the Jesuits and trying to figure out who I am now, maybe it'd be really good to have just a year. So I was doing a residency, just a year with a good cohort who can help me ask some of these questions, good supervision. And then along the way, I'll kind of get some pastoral care skills and that'll serve me whatever I end up doing. And I really wound up getting both. I got the holding environment to kind of process my new identity as I was leaving the Jesuits. So highly recommend it just for that. And I kind of was in a good place in my life to rediscover chaplaincy. And I was a little bit more mature and I was like, okay, I can do it at this point. Uh, it just felt like a better fit for me, somewhat older, a little bit more experience. So this probably isn't helpful because I'm saying like, you just kind of got to try things and, you know, maybe the path isn't always straight, but, uh, but try it and you'll kind of figure out if it's for you, uh, if the setting's right for you, um, if the if the moment kind of falls well. I would say uh, qualities uh, in a good chaplain. Uh, everyone's different. Uh, everyone brings their own personality and their own style. So there's no one single kind of mold for a chaplain. Uh, but generally an openness to personal growth is really important because when we do this uh, training, kind of the whole CPE model for me is we can't journey with other people to places we haven't journeyed within ourselves. And so you go into your own anger so that you can be with people who are angry and so on and so forth. So are you really open to personal growth? And do you see personal growth and self-discovery as going hand in hand with the process of offering pastoral care to others? Um, I would say that uh, comfort with ambiguity is a really wonderful quality in a chaplain. Uh, as I think Jack said, we're not going in there just to talk about religious and spiritual concerns, much less to say, here's what you should be believing or here's the way to do it. It's really a question of listening receptively to whatever a person brings. And often that'll be a lot of ambiguity. So do we have a comfort with that ambiguity, um, a willingness to be there without having to fix? And then uh, certainly compassion for people who are sick, people who are dying, people who are in difficult situations. Um, those are all wonderful qualities. So if you see those qualities in yourself and there's something kind of tugging at you to say, maybe this is seed of a vocation, um, wonderful thing to, to do. Some people come into chaplaincy out of other careers in ministry where maybe it's more administrative. So we've got so many pastors from various traditions uh, in chaplaincy who said, you know, I just, I wanna be with people a little bit more. Um, these are some of the paths that people take. So could certainly uh, share more about discernment, but I'll just end with uh, another story. Again, another vignette, just to kind of give an idea. Uh, I was paged uh, to see a patient once, um, kind of middle-aged woman who uh, was tearful. So the nurse said, you know, she's crying about something and, and we thought that maybe it would be good for a chaplain to talk to her. And she said, okay, that'd be fine. So I went in, she'd gotten a diagnosis, but it, and we were kind of talking about that and she felt like maybe God was punishing her and that she hadn't lived a good enough life. And that's why she had this, you know, at a fairly young age had gotten this diagnosis. Uh, and what would God be punishing for? And she kind of shared this story um, actually about something really horrible that someone had done to her when she was a younger woman, but she felt a lot of guilt over it and a lot of shame. She felt like it was her fault. Uh, probably hadn't had the chance to process this much with anyone. So just really listening to her and, and allowing her to share and um, reflecting back on the young woman that she was before that happened to her. And could she really judge that young woman for what had happened to her and just kind of doing some, some work like that. Anyway, it was a really meaningful conversation, I think, to her. And at the end, I said, you know, you've shared so vulnerably with me. I don't know if I can just walk out of this room. I wonder before I leave, could we just share a moment of silence together to kind of honor the conversation we've had to honor everything you've shared? And she said, oh, sure. So we kind of just paused. And the silence kind of lengthened itself. You know, at times it kind of opened my eyes, but she was still in the silence. So I closed my eyes again. Finally, uh, the silence ended. And I said, you know, what was that like for you? And she said, now I know what it feels like to be forgiven. So you can't concoct these moments, that, but they happen. Um, when uh, someone is really hurt, 
really vulnerable and someone comes in to offer kindness and compassion, uh, what the spirit is able to do can be very powerful. So that's joy for me in my own vocation as a chaplain. Wow, thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you to all four of you. I'm I'm struck by your courage. Um, Nicholas is all of your courage, but as you were saying, you know, we can't really accompany others in places that we haven't accompanied ourselves, which takes a tremendous amount of courage, right? To be able to um face with authenticity our own our own spaces where we need to be accompanied. Um, that takes a lot of courage. So I'm just grateful and I'm struck in, in hearing all of you share um that courage and i'm also struck uh in in hearing the differences in your experiences and the need for chaplaincy today how much we really do need to create networks for 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 the um, meeting of these spiritual needs right in these different settings and that how valuable it is that the six of us or that the four of you are joining us um to help to create a network um, and so I'm just wondering, as as you've heard from each other, share a little bit if if and I'm also going to say to the, those participants here, um, I see one question in the, in the chat, but and I'll ask others if you have a couple of questions to think about. But if I wanted to ask the panelists, if you in listening to each other wanted to add something, um, wanted to comment um, in terms of your own setting being a little bit different. What, how you're seeing what someone else on the panel shared, um, just briefly, if, if any one of you had that um, response. And Juan, I wonder if you could just unmute the, all the panelists right now for um, for the time being, um, while to allow for that to be a little bit more um, smooth. Every, everyone should have the ability to unmute themselves, okay. including the registrants. Great. Right, so I'll let the panelists and invite, invite the panelists especially to unmute themselves. And if and if you did any of you want to share something in response to what you heard another of the panelists say. I would say um just grateful to hear the stories um from Emily and Nicholas and Jack. And um I would say uh I feel gratitude every day with my job because I get to hear stories um, from about 2000 chaplains who just experience these profound moments in people's life. And the fact that we have the opportunity and the gift to share them um, and to be with them in these profound moments, um, whether they're difficult, sad, hard, happy, um, it's, it's just profound. I can't express enough gratitude. And so just thanks to the other panelists for sharing their stories. And uh, thank, thank you, Nicholas, for um, lifting up that, um, you know, the, the real work of, of preparation in CPE is about, you know, look, self-awareness, right? I mean, I, I always tell students or applicants that, you know, CPE is really about 75% about self-awareness. And we can teach skills and we can help you in a lot of ways, but... Um, uh, that's a perfect way of uh, representing that, that to accompany another. That there's much much to do with the self, the company self, and that that's what I've been doing for the last fifteen years, sitting with students who are who are learning to accompany themselves and uh, lifting up um, dynamics that are just being pushed and tugged at them as they're sitting with um this woman who had some type of uh, maybe abusive situation and all of us are are you know we're human i i say chaplains are professional humans we we carry everything that everybody else does so i john I, you have a question there or bill william um mm. do i do i ever feel unprepared I, yeah sometimes i do feel unprepared um it's it's where the vocation comes in and my trust that that God for me, for Jesus for me, is is in the midst of this encounter. So, but anyway, thank you, Nicholas, for that image. Mm -hmm. Eric, I wonder if you would be willing to share a little bit, um, just because uh, I appreciate we've heard several different. I appreciate both having both Emily and Jack and well, and Nicholas and sharing different settings uh for chaplaincy and i wonder if you maybe could just share a little bit about some of the 
that you're aware of in your role, some of the positions, some of the places that are looking for chaplains that are kind of actively out there. If you, if you, you know, not that you can list them all, but um, just to give people the sense of kind of the, uh, so obviously the hospitals are places where there's a high need for chaplains right now, um, but that's not the only space. And just wondered if you could maybe give people a sense of where the, where chaplaincy might take them um, if they were looking to pursue this vocation today. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, John. I appreciate that question. Um, it's exciting to learn about all these areas of chaplaincy that are growing and some of the areas that are growing exponentially and quickly and that we're having a hard time actually meeting the need is um, corporate chaplaincy. And that's a fun one to learn about. Um, I live in the land of like Microsoft and Amazon and um, the spiritual need in these places is profound. Um, and so that's growing. And there's a couple organizations that we work with that are actively working um, with CEOs and corporations to try to meet a spiritual need for their employees. Um, so that's exciting. The prison ministry field has been growing over the, um, I would say, the last 30 years. The carceral system, there's an incredible need, um, whether it's working in immigration, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Department of Corrections, the jails. Um, they're all very different. And so um, mm -hmm. as you do enter into discernment, um, it's where you want to, it's, is there a particular um clientele, a, a particular area of ministry that you're interested in, because um, that's part of the vocation to chaplaincy is it's chaplaincy, but also what kind of chaplaincy. Um, just as an example, like the Bureau, the Federal Bureau of Prisons up until last year, it was um, you had to be a clergy person to work in um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons if you were a Catholic. And we just had this wonderful conversation with them and our bishops. And um, it's been opened up to the laity now, which is just a huge um, gate that's been opened, a door, a huge door. And so, and they're looking for cha uh, chaplaincy. And in our, in our world, in a lot of the fields of chaplaincy where Catholics are considered a minority faith. Now, some of you might not be Catholic. And so it just depends on your faith background. Um, and so they're coming to us looking for chaplaincy. The other areas, um, so I would say that the carceral system is probably one of the fastest growing in terms of the need. Um, and some of their the qualifications to be a chaplain are different throughout the entire country, whether um, de depending on who you're with. And, and we're trying to work with all the organizations to figure out how we can streamline better. So like if you come through this program at Villanova, you would be ready to jump into one of these programs upon graduation. Um, and community chaplaincy is really big, um, just getting out into the field. Um, regretfully, we have um, more and more um, situations, whether they be weather weather related or mass shootings, but we work very closely with like the Red Cross and providing chaplains to the Red Cross for a lot of these moments um, that are disaster moments. And so our chaplains are really utilized. And and Jack and Nicholas and Emily, you've probably had that experience where you've been called into some of those profound experiences. And so those are growing. Um, so really, as you enter into this discernment process, if chaplaincy is um, for you, would be more than open to talking to you directly so we could talk through kind of what area of chaplaincy you might be interested in. Um, so, yeah. That's great, Erica. And if I could just ask, so from your like big picture perspective of kind of seeing more of the areas, would you say that there's room for like twists and turns in this vocational path? So like, you know, if I felt like I'm going to start off in prisons, I've, I had an experience in a prison and I see the need there and I want to show up in that space. And then at some other point, I know, Nicholas, you were referring to people kind of moving from hospice into in the hospital and back and forth because of just the difference in demands. And so I'm just wondering in the bigger field, you know, I think if, if making an initial choice means that there's openness for there to be other choices that might follow. Absolutely. It's why we're trying to kind of make stackables with the, the CPE experiences. We're trying to work with um, our partners who are ACPE who run CPE experiences to see if they can broaden what types of experiences they offer outside of healthcare. And I would say um, when you discern chaplaincy, I feel like I'm talking too much, but when you discern chaplaincy, there's um, you come in and you're there's a field of chaplaincy you can go into, but what a lot of people don't know is there's this whole other world of leadership. Um, somebody talked about mission development, integration. There's a lot of positions out there, especially in our healthcare field that we can't fill. We just don't have enough people. So there's 
a lot of opportunity for growth in chaplaincy. It's mm-hmm. not a stagnant career at all. That's, that's the exciting part. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, so I'm watching some of the questions come in in the chat and I'm wondering um, if Nicholas, uh, uh, just because you have an MDiv, um, if this question about chaplaincy and MDiv, if you, you know, if you see the, how does, how can the chaplaincy program help someone who is studying an MDiv program? Do you, do you see in your own experience relationship between an MDiv and, and possible chaplaincy preparation? I'm happy to, Eric, are you mentioning that, you know, ordination is no longer necessarily a criteria for some of these chaplain positions that previously had been? Um, but I don't know if Nicholas, you had anything in, that you want you could say in response to that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, my uh, experience. So when you become a chaplain, particularly if you're going to get board certified, but um, when you're going through CPE, there's an anticipation that you're grounded in some kind of religious tradition. And for many people, that's through an MDiv. Sometimes it's through a master's degree. Um, but CPE is really teaching a certain kind of clinical skill and then that self-awareness piece. Um, It's not delving so much into theology. So it's a good complement. And I remember in my own MDiv program, maybe someone else can speak uh, more particularly to Villanova's program because I see there's uh, some questions about that too. Uh, But yeah, I got scripture, I got church history and so on and so forth. And I think we had to take two or we got to take two pastoral care courses, not actually so much. Uh, But CPE and the process of hospital chaplaincy experience um, just expands your gifts and skills as a as a caregiver so much so i think it's they, they really do go hand in hand you need both of them mm-hmm. that's great thank I, you I, uh, I have a student uh who is a princeton student and he he is presbyterian and he had to write his exams for his uh you know his uh nomination and he was really fretting about it and he and i talked and i you know he he's a, he's doing really well in chaplaincy and, uh, you know, we just talked about applying this praxis, you know, this praxis theology to all this uh, scholastic work he has to write about. And he came back, he passed. And I'm not saying it was because of that, but it grounded him, you know, like he had real experience of people suffering and God's people suffering. And he was able to write those responses as highly academic as they were in a sense that all theology is praxis theology. All theology is, we study it because we we want to serve God's people. So um, MDiv and, and, and CPE, is it, it really is a tremendous uh, praxis uh, experience for, mm. for students. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Thanks for making the connection on the praxis front. Um, which is why, in many ways, the uh, the track within our MM, MA in Ministry and Theology program made so much sense because uh, there already was the practice orientation. Um, and so making the CPE units possible at, for part of the credit um, of the degree, um, just, you know, it, it's made sense once we could convince the university that it was worth um, investing the time to do that. So I think making that practice connection is very helpful. Um I see Laura asked a question about um, and some of you talked about, you know, you can't really discern. You have to kind of just get in and, and try it and see um, if you have any thoughts, though, about kind of maybe some first steps um, to see if it might be a good fit. I know, Emily, you talked about just kind of being encouraged to do a unit and see if see if you, you know, how you felt. Um, are there do you have any thoughts, any of you thoughts about maybe a step before maybe doing a CPE unit that might be an initial discerning exercise or experience. Um, Yeah, anything that comes to mind along those lines. Yeah, I'll share that what came to mind was um, the certification in pastoral ministry. We were doing a lot of the CPE kind of things. So we had supervision. We had, um, we wrote like verbatims and things like that. Can you just say briefly what that that is? Just a brief summary of a verbatim, Emily, for for people that may not necessarily know. Great point. Yeah, a verbatim is like an encounter you have, and then you write about your feelings around it with each kind of line and their like what their the recipient's response was. So it's offering kind of a snapshot of an encounter you have that was ministry related, and then kind of sharing that piece about well, where are you and where are they and were you following them and So that for me helped me to kind of say, okay, I've seen a little taste of what CPE is. Um, And the um, certification part, 
I did coursework the first year and the second year. So that first year was a little bit of a taste. And then I did in the summer, I did a unit because I thought, well, this is really interesting things. And I learned a lot through the unit. Mm -hmm. That's great, Emily. So so the the kind of the verbatim and reflecting on particular ministerial encounters and the the companion the accompaniment around that that reflection could be a helpful um, yeah. a helpful discernment mm -hmm. step. And there's like websites too, like Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. There's many like resources out on the web right now that I'm sure you could kind of browse and get a perspective. NAC has or NACC has several videos too talking about what chaplaincy is and so that might give you an insight too hmm. um and then I'll, if others have questions i'm gonna let you unmute in a minute i see matt you had a question about villanova's program um it's not geared toward a, a specific area of chaplaincy uh other than the fact that right now the accredited cpe units are all in hospitals um which you know may change um and as erica has kind of shared there's there's so much growth happening that we could get to a place where there are accredited cpe programs in other spaces as well but because the accredited programs are in hospitals the cpe units that come with villanova's degree would be in in a hospital setting um the courses aren't necessarily geared only towards a uh, hospital setting um and and the degree our degree does not grant accreditation um right so it would give you the theology coursework plus some more than enough theology coursework and then two out of the four cpe units for full board certification and the two that you would need to start to apply for associate uh, associate as associate chaplain um so the program itself doesn't give doesn't give accreditation um and it's not specifically focused in a particular area, but the CPE units would happen in a hospital and they would set you up to be able to apply for either as an associate chaplain or a board certified chaplain um, through like NACC's process, but it wouldn't have to be NACC, um, ACPE. So you wouldn't have to be certified particularly as a Catholic chaplain um, to be certified. I wanna um, invite others um, if there are questions. So um, if, if you have, Particular questions, I know we have a few minutes left that are about your own application process. Um, Jennifer and I would welcome you to kind of email us separately if you're kind of questioning the admissions process or how do you finish your application. We, we're totally happy, happy to accompany students in those questions. It's just more easily done kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we'd welcome you, maybe Jennifer can put our email addresses in the chat. Um, you could reach out to either or both of us directly with those questions. But if you had a more general question about chaplaincy education, about the pathway of, toward chaplaincy, um, and you either wanted to put it into the chat or unmute yourself and ask it, we have some time for those questions. Um, I noticed there is a question um, that William Collins shared. Um, if there's other questions, we can get to those, but I don't know if, if this is, uh, there was a question about, are there other accreditations needed to work in reform retirement communities like UCC? Um, I work with like an interdisciplinary team of like um, different religious backgrounds, mainly Christian, but um, we all, I think Nicholas shared that we all come from like our own theological grounding and minister out of that. And so if that helps you, William, to answer that question, some of the peers that I work with have, um, like they are ordained um, chaplains or ordained ministers. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the nature of coming together. Mm. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. Other questions about the track at Villanova, about the field of chaplaincy, some of the distinctions that were maybe offered in terms of different settings for doing chaplaincy. Um, I was thinking a little bit, Erica, about your comment about corporate cha corporate chaplaincy, um, and just how you know. Um, Certainly, different settings could be better for different seasons of your life. You, know, you might not be able to be in a trauma setting for 20 years and feel like, you know, how do you, I, you know, I don't know how someone would um, continually show up again and again and again in that space. I could imagine corporate chaplaincy, right? Jack, you were talking about kind of the raw experience 
and some of the struggle of corporate jobs, it could be that the the numbness of our the the numbed experience um, makes it kind of less available for for pastoral care, makes us more withdrawn, more distant. And so there's other challenges that come in that setting. Whereas in a hospital, when you're dealing with trauma, you know, we're before God or before the divine, and there isn't that same set of barriers, which, you know, um, has its its beauty. And also, um, I could see why over long periods of time, it would also uh, require real deep commitment um, and, and your own personal resources to be able to, to continue to show up. So I was just thinking about the different, the different kinds of challenges that might come in different settings. Um. Mm -hmm. John Jude answered a very asked a very good question. Is it possible to address that? I'm sorry, did I miss that? It's down at the bottom. Can someone who has an MA I wonder in... maybe yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Can someone who has an MA in theology, now the chaplain in track, be certified as a chaplain or is it further credit needed? So it's a good question. So um the and maybe Erica, you want to speak to this, but so the, the accreditation um, comes through the CPE units and having a certain number of theology credits. So the MA program would give you enough credits on the theology side. Um, it would not give you the CPE units, but people are you can get CPE units yourself. You know, you don't need Villanova to do that. We happen to be able to give some credit for those units if it apply if it helps your degree. Um, but you don't need Villanova but to be able to get the CPE units. Um, so I don't know, Erica, if you want to, or maybe even Emily, since you're going through the process, in terms of the steps for um, actually becoming um, a credit, becoming certified beyond what theology is required, credits are required, what CPE is required, and then what the process looks like beyond that. Mm -hmm. I can share a little bit, Erica, if you, if you want to um, carry on. Um, so I attended Villanova before there was a track. And so like um, John was sharing that this track, um, I'm really excited about because it gives you credit towards your completion of your degree. Um, so by doing the units, you're not only working towards your certification, but you're also working towards completing your, your degree. Um, and so I like a, didn't, so I did the Villanova masters and then I just did the units on my own. Um, the goal is to have four units in total and then you can, and then I think, I don't remember the credit number that you have to have in a master's program, but a certain amount of credits. And then you can um, write some reflection papers and go for board certification and um, continue with that process. Yeah, thank you. And Emily, good luck with your process. It's exciting. It's a lot of work, but it's well worth it. Um, mm -hmm. So really kind of two levels of certification. Emily is working towards her board certified um, certification, which is definitely uh, for most, I would say healthcare facilities is the way you wanna go. And then um, as we explore areas outside of healthcare, we're really um, starting to promote our associate um, certification. And that's two CPE units with some graduate level courses. And so it's going through your discernment to see how you want to move forward. It depends on the organization. If you come through NECC, our um, qualifications are a little different than if you go through the Association of Professional Chaplains. And I can add that link in there. Um, you, as a Catholic, you can get certified through either body. It depends on your local ordinary. Some of the ordinaries prefer that you do one or the other. And so um, you'd want to just over time and time, once you get into this, field you'd want to pursue that conversation um so yeah i can share that link with you though mm -hmm. so erica is it is it 36 credits of theology for nacc is it 36 i believe so yeah and that's for the full board certification whereas yeah. for the yeah. associate chaplaincy you only need some graduate credits yeah. yes i will say if you look on our website our information for our associate certification is not updated we're changing it we just overall overhauled the entire program so we'll get that up there as soon as possible and just to say too in response to jude's question so even even if you're not in the chaplaincy track 
um, we definitely would help students in our programs to find and discern a CPE program, a CPE unit. So like when Emily was in our program, she was looking for CPE units at a hospital. You know, we certainly did everything we could to support her to find one that was accredited, that was going to be local to her, that was going to be, you know, um, convenient, uh, geographically convenient. Um, and so we're certainly willing to work with other students and not on the chaplaincy track to take some of the steps that you would need to take to discern chaplaincy and then to think about would I want to you know be an associate chaplain or become certified even if you weren't in that particular track. I'm aware of our time and um, just how gracious the four of you uh, were are have been in um, being willing to be with us not only your time but just the the authenticity of your presence and your willingness um, to um, to share vulnerably and, and honestly about your experience um, to virtual strangers, um, some of whose faces you can see and some of whom you can't see. Um, but thank you so much for sharing some of your own pathway, some of your own experience, um, and for helping Villanova really to, to think about how do we serve, how do we serve future chaplains, how do we serve those agencies and those spaces that are that are in need of chaplains, uh, how do we create a program that is more at the service of a wider um, a wider range of the community? Um, and so grateful for your time, not only here, but your time in answering our questions, putting up with our our level of detail, giving us feedback, giving us critique, so that our program can be can be better. I know that we need your partnership um, going forward to really be able to form chaplains in the ways that. The world will continue to need them. And then can I just make a quick comment, Dr. Edwards? Please. So I'm currently a graduate student at Villanova. So those that don't have experience with Villanova, they're very supportive. All the professors are great. Um, they really meet your needs. Um, I was under supervision with Jack. So I am currently a chaplain at Holy Redeemer Hospital. I still need to get two more units of CPE, but one person commented about, you know, like, how can you discern about this? And I feel like I discerned with working in the hospital in a different position. And I've just like asked the chaplains different questions, like, what do you do? What is this all about? And then I would ask, like, you know, can I learn more about this? So I feel even asking a chaplain different questions or maybe having the opportunity to shadow a chaplain if possible. Mm. That would help you also discern if you want to be chaplain or not. Mm. But I feel even if you wouldn't become a chaplain, even taking one unit of CP like helped me so much to better understand myself, as Nicholas said, and Jack and the others, Erica and Emily. You know, you really have to search deep within yourself and look at your story and your history and I didn't understand it all, but I feel now, even as a religious, it's helped me live better in community, be a better chaplain, and just be a better person and understand myself. Mm. Thank you, Sister Kim. And that's a great suggestion of being able to, you know, shadow and talk to a chaplain. And if those of you that don't necessarily have those relationships, Villanova, we're building them now. So like if you if you want to connect in that way and a more one on one way with it with an existing chaplain, you know, we're developing those relationships on purpose. So you can certainly reach out to Jennifer and I um, if you're looking for more of those conversations. We do hope to build more kind of discernment opportunities into our program. Um, available to master's students at Villanova, um, whether it's visiting a hospital, whether it's bringing a chaplain in for kind of a lunch conversation, we, we are hoping to build some of those pieces more into the program as we're making this track available. So if we can be helpful to any of you individually as you're looking for those discernment opportunities or prompts, um, please reach out to us and we will do what we can to connect you with um, an appropriate resource. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you to our participants who joined us. We really appreciate your time, your presence, your willingness to, to kind of listen deeply for the past hour and a half almost um, and hope that the listening deeply is in and of itself part of the discernment process and what maybe allows you to to pay attention to something inside of yourself that was brought up, that was that was ignited, that was raised to the surface. You know, um, if any of that happened, pay attention. You don't you don't need our permission to, but I hope that um, you pay attention to those those kind of responses um, as part of your own discernment process, um, either at Villanova or somewhere else. You know, um, 
So thank you so much. Um, wishing you all a peaceful evening. Um, and we look forward to more conversations and questions from you going forward.